Hey y'all, my name is Yvette and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a very late March wrap up. In the month of March, I read 27 books, but before I get to those, I'm gonna go over my reading stats and everything's gonna be timestamped below if you wanna jump around. For the audience of all the books I've read, I read 11 adult books, seven young adult books, three middle grade books, and six all ages books. For the genre, I read four contemporary, 10 fantasies, six sci-fis, three horrors and or thrillers, two nonfiction, and two romance. For the format of what I read everything in, I read 15 ebooks, one physical book, and 11 audiobooks. I rated three books, two stars, seven books, three stars, 13 books, four stars, and then four books, five stars. And this year, I also started looking at who I'm reading from, so the diversity of the authors of the books I'm reading. And for the gender, I read 12 books from cis women, 12 books from cis men, and three books from trans or non-binary folks. 12 of the authors I read were white, and then 15 were people of color. 15 of these authors were straight, and 12 were openly queer. As for where I got all these books from, 14 of them I owned and 13 were from the library. Altogether, I had a page count of 6,561 pages. The first book I read was The Cooking Gene, A Journey Through African American Culinary History in the Old South by Michael W. Twitty. Michael W. Twitty is a gay Jewish African American man and a culinary historian and this is his nonfiction book about exploring his identity and history through Southern cuisine. It's part memoir, part history book, and part exploration of genealogy and it was pretty great. I rated it a 5 out of 5 stars and I did a full review on it that I'll link down below so I won't go into it too much here. Twitty toured the southern states of the US where his ancestors were enslaved to look at how they cooked and what they cooked and why they cooked the way they cooked and by looking at his roots in this way he was able to honor his past while healing from generational trauma. The next book I read was My Beloved World by Sonia Sotomayor and this is a memoir from the first Latinx Supreme Court Justice and it was so good. This book really takes us through a lot of her life. She was diagnosed with diabetes as a child and she had an alcoholic father and then she went to Princeton and then Yale Law School and then worked for the DA for a while. She got married and then divorced and she's just a really incredible woman who has accomplished a lot. Some of my favorite parts in this book was when she was talking about her college experiences because she was a first generation college student and so was I and I saw a lot of my experiences mirrored in this book. Something she talked about was the culture shock of going from a predominantly Latinx environment to a predominantly white environment and for her especially she went to college right when affirmative action became a thing so a lot of her white classmates thought she was only there because of affirmative action not that she actually deserved to be there and that's something that i got a lot when i was in college but i can't imagine what it was like back then especially in an ivy league college like yale but not only that there was this class and knowledge gap a lot of the kids she was in class with went to much better high schools than her and they knew much more about everything, not just academics, but everything. These were kids with multi-million dollar trust funds that had different patterns of speech and vocabularies and that was something she had to adapt to. She always felt like she was behind for that reason and like she was unequipped to deal with this new world she found herself in. So that's when she decided to become not only a student of academics, but a student of life in general. And that continued on until after she finished her education. She also touches on the survivor's guilt of going away to college and quote unquote making it in life when kids that she grew up with didn't. And just everything about that section about her college experience I really related to and I really loved and this was a really good book. Next I read volume one and two of All New Ghost Rider by Felipe Smith and oh boy was I disappointed by these. I'm trying to get back into reading more Marvel and DC comics and I thought I'd start off with something that I remember liking and I remember really enjoying these comics. It follows the newest ghostwriter, Robbie Reyes. He's a Mexican-American teenager living in LA with a disabled brother. Robbie is still in high school, but their parents have abandoned them, so he is the sole provider and works on the side in a mechanic shop. He tries to earn a little money by drag racing in cars that aren't his, so one night he's doing that and he gets chased down because there are drugs in the trunk of the car that he's borrowed and things happen from there. So rereading this, I did see what I liked about it before because there's a lot of potential with the character of Robbie Reyes, but I don't think the execution was here. And mostly I think that because the Latinx representation in it is not that great. The writer is an Afro-Latinx man who has lived in LA before, so you'd think that a representation would be okay, but there is just 
over the top cello stereotypes right and left just really over exaggerated and unnecessarily so. There was a little thing that I didn't notice the first time around that pushed my rating to a two stars and that is that only the villains speak Spanish. Even though Robbie is Latinx too, his behaviors and patterns of speech are noticeably different from the kids around him and that doesn't make sense that that would be a thing unless you're trying to code your villains to be a certain kind of way. That was all in volume one but then I stuck around for volume two and that turned out to be a mistake because it got really weird and dark and edgy for no reason and Robbie's little brother, his disabled brother, got neglected and abused and it's just something I really didn't want to read about. Next I read the first three books in the Daughters of the Moon series which was Goddess of the Night, Into the Cold Fire, and Nightshade. This is a fantasy YA series about four teenage girls who discover that they are the daughters of a moon goddess. They each have a different power and they use that power to fight an all-powerful evil named the Aatrox. This series started back in 2000 and my love for it runs deep. Back in like the fifth or sixth grade, all my friends got together and we would read these books together and talk about it together and we'd each choose a different girl that we most identified with and just had a lot of fun with it. And this series very much reads as early 2000s magical girl, like Charmed meets Sailor Moon but pure delightful teenage wish fulfillment. These girls go clubbing on weekdays and they never run out of body glitter and they have these outrageous fabulous outfits and one of them has a raccoon for a pet and it just it's all great. Reading it today in 2019 the series aged a lot better than I thought it would but I would say that my major problem with it is that one of the girls is Mexican-American and she's written like a Mexican chola game beggar stereotype. There are just so many things wrong with the representation but one of the things that got to me the most is that the author liked to cherry pick words in the text to just translate to Spanish and then immediately say what that word was in English and a lot of times the Spanish wasn't even right. There was literally the phrase a clicka of enemy homegirls and all that did bother me but I still love the series and I do plan on finishing it. Next I read Long Macchiatos and Monsters by Allison Evans. This is a queer romance novella and Lately, with the queer romance novellas I've been reading, I've been thinking that they're cute and they're nice but nothing special, but with this one, I really really liked it. This is a romance between a genderqueer college student named Jalen and a disabled trans man named P. Jalen's one true love is B-grade sci-fi movies, so movies that are like Sharknado, and one day they meet Drop Dead Gorgeous P in a coffee shop and they start watching movies together and hanging out and hooking up and it comes to a point where Jalen starts wondering if they're really on the same page of what dating means. This novella made my heart feel so full. Jalen is such an awkward bean who needs to get their shit together and I love them so much. They were so funny and they were like immediately completely and totally sprung on P. It was adorable. Four to five stars. The next book I read was Life is Wonderful, People are Terrific by Melissa Banales and this book is an adult contemporary about a bisexual Chicana girl going to college in California in the 90s. Her name is Missy and Missy has a lot going on. She's 18, it's her first year in college and she's also moonlighting as a stripper and abusing alcohol and she's just terrified of being alone or rejected. Ultimately she's just trying to find her place in the world and she fucks around and fucks up along the way and then she has to deal with the consequences of the choices that she makes and she's just the definition of a hot hot mess. This covers her first entire year of college and it was mostly her skipping classes and getting involved in the punk scene and then later the riot girl scene and then later exploring her intersectional identity of being a queer Chicana woman. She also falls in love and it's just really good. It's all about an imperfect person trying to be and trying to be happy. This would have been a five star read but I wasn't too thrilled about the ending. It was a little abrupt. Content warnings for attempted sexual assault, drug and alcohol abuse, violence, and suicide. The next book I read was Black Leopard Red Wolf by Marlon James and this is a very hyped 2019 adult fantasy. It's about a man named Tracker who has the ability of finding anyone wherever they are as long as he has their scent. He's put onto a team to find a child and they quest onwards to find him and they're stopped many times along the way and it quickly becomes apparent that there is more to this kid than they originally thought and so much happens in this book. I'm gonna start off by saying that I thought this book was just okay. 
the story is not straightforward like it meanders around the plot and sometimes there were multiple versions for the things that are going on and it was like well i don't really know what's happening it gets confusing and intense and disjointed and i didn't know what was going on a lot of the time and the pose is also really difficult and dense. That being said, Marlon James does know what he's doing and even though I was confused, I could still tell that the story was expertly crafted and if I was rating this book just on storytelling and like technical expertise, I would rate it a 5 out of 5 stars. Where this book fell short for me is that I didn't have any characters that I cared about. I only became invested at the 19 hour mark and this is like a 23 or 24 hour audiobook and that is way too long for me not to care about the characters. Along with that, a lot of fucked up things happen to the characters, content warnings for sexual assault, like lots and lots of rape, pedophilia, torture and violence, violence against women and misogyny, and just all around this book is triggering. The last thing I want to mention is that I really hated the ending of this book. I will wade through an ocean of angst to get to a happy ending or even a satisfying ending, but I was not happy or satisfied with the ending of this book and that really hindered my overall enjoyment of the book. But also this book is from a queer black male perspective and anything I say about it should be taken with a grain of salt because it's from a perspective so different from my own and I could be missing a lot of stuff. The next book I read in a significant departure from the last book I read was You Know Me Well by Nina LaCour and David Levithan. This is a YA contemporary about two queer teenagers during San Francisco Pride Week. We have Mark who is in love with his best friend and trying to figure out if he feels the same and then we have Katie who has been in love with this girl from afar forever but then runs away when they finally have a chance to meet. By chance they meet at a bar and they develop an immediate deep and genuine friendship and they help each other with each other's problems. This book was fluffy, it was queer teen wish fulfillment, it was touching and it focused a lot on friendship and individual development just as much if not more than the romantic relationship that was going on. I love this book but I will say that I did think it was a touch too dramatic. There were some parts that were trying really hard to be profound and to me instead they just came off as cheesy. There were a lot of metaphors but also it was very sweet and wholesome. What I like the most is that the two main characters are flawed and like Katie is an unlikable character at some point but they do grow over the course of the book and they help each other grow as they become more important to each other and their friendship was really beautiful. The next book I read was Hexbreaker by Jordan L. Hawk and this was a queer historical paranormal romance and the first in the series. In this world we have witches and familiars who can shapeshift into animals. Witches and familiars can form magical bonds and when they do that, the witch's capability to perform magic is much higher than if they're not bounded. Familiars can bond to any witch, but there is one witch in the world that they are most compatible with and they recognize them immediately upon seeing them. In Hexbreaker, we're following a cat familiar named Cicero who works for the magical police and a witch named Tom who works for the non-magical police and who has a dark criminal past. They're working on different cases that have some commonalities and they're assigned to solve everything together. Cicero immediately recognizes Tom as his witch but for reasons decides not to tell Tom and just wants to solve the case and never see Tom again. I rated this a 3 out of 5 stars because it did take me a while to warm up to the main couple but once I did I really like them. Tom is this really big scary linebacker type who is a teddy bear on the inside and Cicero is aloof and sarcastic with this huge ego and it was a really fun dynamic. My problem with this book is that the main romantic conflict came from Tom's dark past and him keeping who he really is a secret. I think when you have this trope of the big secret there comes a point where lying about who you really are becomes more dishonest and deceptive than anything and there's nothing in the world that could validate you keeping that secret from the person that you are with. And this book does cross that line. It, it makes up for it a bit, but I still hate that it crossed that line. The next book I read was A Very Large Expansive Sea by Tahara Mafi. This is a YA contemporary about a Muslim teenager named Shirin. Shirin wears a hijab and this book takes place in the year 2002, so right after 9-11. That means Islamophobia is really bad and every day the main character is tormented by her classmates and her teachers and by strangers. Her family moves around a lot because of her dad's job and at the start of the book she's starting a new school in a new city 
and at this point she's pretty jaded by all the terrible treatment she's received and she doesn't trust people. So when this boy named Ocean tries to get to know her, she is straight up not having it. Also her and her brother start a breakdancing club at their school and it's amazing. Okay so this is the third book I've read from Mafi this year and just like the first two, I really enjoyed this. Something I think this author does consistently well is character development. The main character has built all these walls around her and for good reason, but as much as they are supposed to protect her, they're also shutting her out from the rest of the world and they're not even working, not really, because she's not happy. And then we have Shirin's love interest, Ocean. He is like the exact opposite of her. He is soft and openly vulnerable and wears his heart on his sleeve for anyone to hurt. He is such a genuine and nice person but he's also very privileged and doesn't really get what Shirin goes through being Muslim and wearing a hijab. The way both of these characters develop and confront Islamophobia and xenophobia is just so well done. I think that all of the issues this book tackles are handled with such great care and respect and that a lot of people would enjoy this book if they picked it up. Also, this book is becoming a movie and that's even more incentive for people to pick it up. The next book I read was Sal and Gabby Break the Universe by Carlos Hernandez and this is a middle grade sci-fi book about a young Cuban-American magician named Sal whose abilities go a little bit further than just a sleight of hand. He and his family have just moved to Miami. It's his first week of school and he keeps getting into trouble for performing magic tricks. A girl named Gabby catches onto his tricks and things kind of happen from there. I know I'm not really explaining what the plot is about and that's because it's difficult to explain what the plot is about and also because I think it's best to go into this book blind I got a lot of enjoyment out of finding out things as they happened. This is the latest book published in the Wick Ride and Presents series and it's so good. It's really weird in a random quirky way but in a good way because it's also very heartfelt. It shows different kinds of family being close and supportive of one another. It shows friends being there for each other in their times of need and Sal and Gabby are just precious, precious little beings. Sal seems like he's a little shit, but he's so caring and empathetic and Gabby is that kid where when you see them, you know that they're going to rule the world one day. For representation, besides Sal and Gabby being Cuban, Sal is also diabetic and also this book handles topics like death and parental abuse and bullying and I think it handles everything pretty well, but at the same time, it doesn't take itself too seriously. Like Sal and Gabby have a lot of fun along the way of breaking the universe and it's just it's everything I love about middle grade. The next book I read was Artemis Fowl The Eternity Cold by Aaron Colfer and this is the third book in the Artemis Fowl series that I am reading as a part of the Artemis Fowl read along. We are reading the entire series leading up to the movie release and I've been really enjoying it so far. In this book, Artemis Fowl continues to be a little shit but one that I've really come to enjoy even more now that his character is developing. He still does crime and has this huge ego, but he's also coming to care about people. In this third book, Artemis is 13 and he's created this supercomputer that combines fairy and human technology and it falls into the wrong hands. Something that I've noticed and liked about the series is that Artemis's strength lie in his intellect and he falls shorter in other departments. Like in this book, the whole reason why he gets into trouble is because he lets his ego get the better of him and he gets tricked. Also when the time comes for Artemis to do something physical, he's so out of his depth and weak and just a delicate flower and it's hilarious. As with the previous two books of this series, right after I read this book, I read the graphic novel adaptation. As an adaption, I think it's great. I think it's a good recap of what happened in the book. But also the more I read of it, the more I just like it because of the art style. I mean, the art has never been exceptionally pretty to look at and that didn't really bother me. But what does bother me is that Artemis is getting older, but the art isn't aging him up. He looks the exact same as he did in the first volume and it's starting to really bug me. The next book I read was Binti by Nadia Okorafor. This is a sci-fi novella about a woman named Binti of the Himba people. And the Hema people never leave their land for any extended amount of time, so when Binti receives acceptance into the most prestigious university in the galaxy, she decides to run away from home to attend school. I've been meaning to read this book for quite a while now, and after the Kwanzaa Reflectathon where everyone was recommending this book, I really wanted to get around to it finally, and I did, and I'm really glad because it was really good. 
I've only read one other Nadia Korfor book, but something I've noticed is that the worlds she builds are always very unique. Binti is what's called a harmonizer, and if we're being completely honest, I'm still not sure what exactly that is and what all that entails, but it is fascinating to read about. It has something to do with working technology and math. I don't really know, but I'm listening, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the series. The next book I read was Being Hers by Anna Stone, and this was a BDSM erotic queer love story about the owner of a very private high clientele bar and one of her bartenders. I did not like this book. I gave it a personal rating of two stars but I didn't rate it on Goodreads because I think it's self-published and also because a lot of the problems I had with this book seem like more personal problems than problems with the book. I went into this book blind when the ebook went on sale and I should have done my research, that was completely on me. It had a bunch of tropes that I don't really like, like a romance between a boss and an employee and an age gap, but I will say that the age gap was between a 23 year old and a woman in her early 30s and I didn't really mind it much in here. Mostly I didn't like the imbalance of power in the couple. We have Vanessa the bar owner and Mel the bartender and Vanessa gets Mel's personal information from employee records without telling Mel. So she'll text Mel without getting Mel's number from her and she'll send her assistant to Mel's home and she showed up at Mel's school unannounced and it was creepy. And when they finally sit down and talk about their relationship and what all it's gonna entail, Vanessa is telling Mel the rules while filling up on Mel and asking her hey, like do you understand while distracting Mel and it just really really creeped me out because clear informed consent is so important especially in a BDSM relationship like this. All of that happened in the first third of the book and it really rubbed me in the wrong way to the point where I couldn't enjoy myself while I read the rest of the book. Like my standards were pretty low going into this book. I was ready to not read critically and just have a good time but when all that happened, I kept finding problems with every single little thing. I didn't buy into the romance, I thought the characters were weak, and the writing was okay. I feel like I'm speaking too harshly about this book, so I might try to pick up another from this author and see if that works for me better. The next book I read was Kingdom of Copper by S.A. Chakraborty, and this was the second book in the David Bod trilogy following City of Brass, and it was amazing. We follow a con woman named Nari who accidentally summons a deva while she's on one of her cons and she's whisked off to the city of devas. She finds herself in a new world trying to survive the politics and learn about her own magic and family history. I was so nervous going into this book because I love City of Brass so much and I was scared that Kingdom of Copper wasn't going to live up to the first book and also because the first book ended up on a cliffhanger and there's a five year gap between these two books and I didn't know how that was going to be handled. But overall I think this book followed up the first one really well and I really loved it. It's a kind of book where I don't have any major complaints. Like the plot kept me interested, the characters kept me invested in the story. I felt compelled to finish this book and find out if all my favorite characters were going to be okay. I'm not sure what else I could say that won't be straight up gushing but I love Ali with all my heart. Next I'm talking about Justice League Dark Volume 1 and Wonder Woman and Justice League Dark The Witching Hour. I'm talking about these two together because the plot overlaps. It starts in Justice League Dark and then halfway through Wonder Woman and Justice League Dark happens and then the rest of Justice League Dark is a completely different story. So something happened in the Justice League comic to make magic go haywire. Magic is turning on magic users and it's gonna die out so Wonder Woman decides to put a team together to find out what's going on. I really like this. Going in I wasn't sure if I was going to because I do love Justice League Dark and I've never imagined Wonder Woman being a part of that but I thought it was done really well. When Wonder Woman starts trying to form this team the magical community treats her like she's a joke and like she's meddling in business that's not her own but the comic really plays up Wonder Woman's ancient Greece background and all these mythological elements. It was a new side to Diana and one that I was really interested in seeing. I felt like this book added something to the Wonder Woman mythos. Besides that there's plenty to like here. There is some funny dialogue and Constantine will pop up and then dip out. There's a fully intelligent chimpanzee who owns a magic bar and wields a sword and the art is really pretty even though it does have that problem of a lot of faces look alike but I was willing to forgive that because the cover of The Witching Hour with Wonder Woman looks really dark and creepy and I love it. The next book I read was The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Lavelle and this is a tour.com novella. 
It's a retelling of the H.P. Lovecraft story, The Horror at Red Hook, from the perspective of a black man. This takes place in 1920s Harlem where a small time hustler named Tom is just trying to keep him and his ailing father afloat. Basically that means he goes on odd jobs and then he goes to white neighborhoods playing jazz guitar even though he doesn't know how to play that well but the white people can't tell that. One day Tom is playing in a white neighborhood and this guy comes up to him and is like hey come play at my mansion party and I'll pay you this amount of money that Tom really can't refuse. So he goes to play and things happen. So H.P. Lovecraft is notoriously racist and xenophobic but some of the main themes of this book is racism both personal and institutional and police brutality against black men and I think Lavelle's choice to focus on those themes was really smart. Tom is harassed for being in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time and simply existing and like he's a small time hustler he's not coming by his money honestly but in this time and place there aren't a lot of options for a black man to make a living that won't break him. So he's doing what he has to do. As the plot takes off, Tom gets involved in the occult and the police are after him and it gets pretty violent and gory. So content warnings for that. Overall, I really enjoy this and I gave it a four to five stars. The next book I read was In an Absent Dream by Shauna McGuire and this is the fourth book in the Wayward Children series. This series is about kids who go through portals to fantasy worlds where they have grand adventures and then for whatever reason they get sent back to the regular world and they desperately want to go back to their fantasy worlds. This book is a sort of prequel. We follow one of the characters from the first book named Lundy and it gives her background. As a child, she was very bookish and logical and expected to go on to have a traditional life of raising kids and having a husband and all that. One day, she comes upon a door in the trunk of the tree and goes through it to find the goblin market. In this world, everything is based off of bargaining and giving fair value for whatever you get, whether that be a hot meal or a secret from a friend giving fair value is the law of the land. As Lundy grows up, she travels back and forth between the goblin market and our world and by her 18th birthday she has to decide which one she wants to stay in. There are a lot of time jumps in this book. It doesn't really follow the adventures that Lundy has in the goblin market and more focuses on her comings and goings and what eventually led to the decision she makes of whether or not she wants to stay in the goblin market. Before reading this book I didn't really know anything about the goblin market and I wasn't really interested in finding out but as I read I was pretty quickly sold on the concept and I ended up really loving this book. I loved how the magic world used this concept of fairness. Like the price of something wouldn't be the same if you had $10 in your pocket versus if you had $1,000 in your pocket and the world would punish you if you're too greedy and you try to take advantage of someone. The story broke my heart a little bit even though I knew what kind of story it was going to be based off of where the character is in the first book of the series but overall I really enjoyed it and I gave it 5 out of 5 stars. The next book I read was Shatterstar Reality Star by Tim Seeley. Shatterstar is a queer Marvel character and one of my favorites from X Factor. He's originally from Mojo World which is a world in a different dimension and a different time and there he was a slave where we had to fight to the death for entertainment so basically a gladiator but also a reality TV star against his will and he's long escaped from that world where he came to our world and became an X-Men and he's lived this whole other life in the 616. So I went into this comic a little angry and with very low expectations. For a long time in the comics, Shatterstar was with his boyfriend Richter and last year in the Iceman solo series they broke them up off page and I'm just so angry that they would break up such a long-standing queer couple because we don't have a lot of those. They would break them off and not even give them the respect of doing it within their own series on the page. So I went into this book hoping to find out what happened between them and I did find out and I thought it was stupid. But besides all that, what this book is actually about, Shatterstar has retired from the hero business and he's now of the owner of an apartment complex where he leases out to other people who have been displaced from different dimensions. It's there where Shatterstar's past catches up with him and some people from Mojo World kidnap some of his tenants and he has to go and get them back. This was an okay comic. I'm glad Shatterstar was able to headline in his own comic but overall the story was pretty meh. 3 out of 5 stars. The next book I read was What If Magic by Leah Williams. 
The What If series is a Marvel series where they take a character and they take a point in their background and they say instead of this happening what if this happened and what would their life look like if this happened. So this book does that with a character named Ileana Rasputin codenamed Magic. In the regular timeline Magic was kidnapped at a young age and taken to this other dimension called Limbo where she was tormented and taught magic. However, when she came of age and developed her mutant abilities, she was able to escape and join the X-Men. In this comic, whenever she escapes, instead of going to the X-Men, she goes to Doctor Strange and becomes his apprentice. This book is only 21 pages, but it packs so much content into 21 pages and the art is beautiful, the story is entertaining, and it was really well done. Ileana has just come off of years of constantly fighting for survival and she's so distrustful but then Doctor Strange is able to earn her trust and her respect and he mentors her and it's really beautiful. And finally the last thing I read in March was The Authority Volume 1 by Warren Ellis. This is a Wildstorm comic from the early 2000s and it's a reread from me. I saw Jen from Remembered Reads talking about this in a few of her videos and it reminded me of it because I never made it past the first volume even though I liked it so I wanted to reread it and continue on with the series. This is about a team of superheroes who are specifically interested in not really saving the world but making the world better. They operate out of this giant sentient spaceship and they react to threats like invading aliens from different dimensions. I don't really have much to say about this series besides it was a really solid first volume and I'm looking forward to reading the rest of the series. I can tell that there's going to be a found family trope and I'm ready for it. To be honest I picked up this comic because I knew that there was a queer couple in it. We have Apollo who's basically Superman and then Midnighter who is an edgier Batman that kills and I'm looking forward to seeing more of them. So that was all 27 books I read in the month of March. If you've read any of these books come talk to me in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.